hear me? Hello. Hi again. Um, hi. hi. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, for coming. In case you didn't hear my first round of introductions, um, my name is Kat. Um, I run the space. I'm the director of art exhibitions and outreach here at the university. Um, I'd also, just one more time, like to thank the Margaret E. Burnham Foundation for sponsoring this exhibition. Um, we're going to do a fairly short artist talk, um, and I'm just going to give a quick bio for both of our artists here. Um, I'm going to start with Jackie, who's on my right. Um, Jackie Malad is a Baltimore City-based artist whose mixed media, abstract paintings, and collages address the history and complexities of dispersed cultural heritage and multi-ethnic identity. She has participated in numerous group and solo exhibitions nationally and internationally. In 2022, Jackie received the Municipal Art Society of Baltimore City Travel Prize to conduct in-depth research on the Egyptian antiqu antiquities held at the British Museum and Petrie Museums in London. Her work is included in several public collections, including the Baltimore Museum of Art, Academy Art Museum, Johns Hopkins University, Sheridan Library, sorry, that's Johns Hopkins University Sheridan Library, um, Robert W. Deutsch Foundation, the Pizzuti Collection, and Meta Open Art Program. Milad received her BFA from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts University. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, and her MFA from Towson University. She is currently represented by SoCo Gallery in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and on my left is Libby Paloma, um, sometimes known as Nacho, sometimes. Um, and uh, Libby is an interdisciplinary artist currently based in New York, New York, New York City. Um, Palo Paloma's work is influenced by aspects of their Me Mexican American queer disabled identity often using soft sculpture, installation, and performance to create gentle environments and often humorous encounters. Inspired by everyday objects and natural surroundings, Paloma's installations and performances are an invitation to rest in a fluffy, puffy, tender world. <laughs> Paloma's work has been exhibited at El Museo di Barrio in New York City, Burlington City Arts in Burlington, Vermont, Soma Arts in San Francisco, Space Gallery here in Portland, I don't know if Kelsey is still here. No. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, and many other places. <laughs> um, she also received an award of excellence um, for her installation in Queer Works exhibition at Silver Mountain Ga Gallery in New Canaan, Connecticut. Paloma holds a bachelor's degree in liberal studies, a master's degree in communicative disorders from San Francisco State University, and a Master of Fine Arts from Parsons School of Design, the new school, where they received the President and University Full Scholarship. So welcome. Thank you for working with us. Um, I really need to get to my questions. Um, so I wanted to start with the fact that both of you decided to create new work for the show. And I was wondering if you could Tell us a little bit about what inspired your new pieces that are on display here. And we can start with whoever really wants to take it. I can tell both of you are excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, OK, yeah. So this um, work is, can, can you hear me OK? Is this good? Okay. Um, this work is, I'm like still, I gotta say, I'm still like reeling from Nacho. Let's just say it, I did our performance <laughs> and Nacho was in the room. And anyway, if you see me, I have like mustache um, happening, uh, glue happening. But anyway, moving on. Um, no, so this work, um, I, I was really inspired by um, idioms actually. Uh, so like turns of phrases that are used um, you know, across cultures, across languages, but I was thinking specifically about, you know, like some of the um, sort of American usages of um, certain idioms. And the one that I landed on to build this installation was um, the idea of like dot, 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 no picnic. So I make um, my work from like a personal, like all of my works are sort of from like a personal place. Um, and I, and I, live with um, chronic illness, you know, I, and um, 
like heart disease from a connective tissue disorder. And it's like dot, 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 no picnic, you know? <laughs> and so I, so I thought about um, making these soft sculptures um, and creating sort of this idiomatic picnic. Um, so there's like a lot of absurdity here, um, you know, like upon verse flush, you can sort of recognize it as a picnic, but then like if you sit with it for a little while longer, you realize like this isn't a functional picnic. Um, and so, like, you know, the materiality um, along with the absurdity of this particular work um, sort of, like, is playing with um, not only, like, the turns of phrases here, but also, like, all of the different, um, with language in general, you know, by thinking about it in these literal terms. Um, and, you know, also just, like, the idea of embodying softness and like um, thinking through um, that idea sort of like under this idea of no picnic. Um, yeah, so that's sort of where I, what I'm inspired by with, and how I sort of landed on this work. Thank you. <laughs> Jackie, would you like to talk about what inspired your new body of work? Yeah, I, you know, the, the, the thing about um, working in your studio is that you get into, oh, I'm having like a weird ear thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm talking inside my head and mm -hmm. outside. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but when you're in your studio, you're really, you get kind of in these modes of making and that sometimes are hard to kind of get out of. Um, you know, for me, it was just um, scale and the, the creating these really like over, on purpose, overworked giant <laughs> pieces. And um, so uh, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to really, um, you know, almost let go uh, a little bit. Um, so not feeling, <laughs> you all might be thinking like, well, there's a lot going on on these pieces. But for me, I look at them and I'm like, they're very um, sparse. Um, and the fact that they're small, uh, typically I work like maybe seven feet by seven feet, 11 feet by 11 feet is uh, probably the largest. And um, so they, they, yeah, I just, I found this like as an opportunity to, to just try a different approach in the studio. Um, the other thing that I, um, uh, really wanted to to kind of play with for this show specifically thinking about excavation and um, so much of my work is um, additive and so like constantly adding layers and layers um, but in these works again this is this is not maybe so obvious to you all but in these works there's a lot of subtractive things that have happened um, so um, taking, for example, the three pieces in the back there, those are, those are all works that was all, they were all one piece. Um, so that was one, um, piece that was about 68 inches by 68 rectangular or square and, um, and cut up into, into pieces and repurposed or replaced or however you spliced together to create a new sort of um, composition. But there, um, but there's a lot of layers that I ripped off of the work. Um, so that, again, is like a really new, not really new, but it is a new approach in the studio for me. Um, and this one, you know, I, um, I think also just letting go of uh, empty space, you know, I have such a maximalist tendency that I, you know, just want to go full on whenever I see white empty wall or white empty space. <laughs> and so this was a real like test of my, my restraint. And, you know, the large white piece is pretty obviously a piece of canvas that was discarded. The, um, this blue shape was um, a part of that larger piece that was on the floor. And so like these, this excavation and reapplication is a really big part of 
all of these works. The two on that side were, you can kind of, you can see relationship, I think. Um, and then the work, the large work that's um, hidden from my view, but behind that wall, that's um, a little bit more on, um, you know, a piece that's uh, to be uh, continued. <laughs> and so what I mean by that is eventually it'll have or be excavated and, and repurposed. Um, so that gives you a sense of um, a work prior to that action. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so there are also, I, I think, quite a few notable parallels at the core of the bodies of work that you've both produced for this show. Um, and it's, it's funny because you were working, obviously, separately. You live in different places. And, but, you know, we had a few meetings about what the show might be about, and you both kind of came to some interesting conclusions. So um, both of you are investigating how language and narrative respectively, um, can hinder our comprehension of multifaceted and nuanced stories. Nuanced stories. <laughs> um, and I was wondering if you could talk a bit about what got you interested in that type of examination. Um, we can keep volleying, maybe. Sure. Can I, like, see the question, too? Number two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, so... Language is, um, yeah, so language is something that um, I studied. Uh, so communicative disorders um, was something that I studied uh, in, in my previous career um, as a speech language pathologist. Um, so I'm really interested in how language functions or doesn't function um, and why. Um, and um, and sometimes um, in that practice, that's my dog, <laughs> my other dog, <laughs> shaking. Hi, Peanut. Um, so uh, so in in this, so uh, so I'm sort of like always fascinated by language, um, especially as someone who uh, experiences a lot of brain fog <laughs> um, and sort of like the disappearance of language. And the um, and I know a lot of people can relate to having brain fog and um, or know people, you know, especially like after the pandemic, you know, there are a lot of people who who live with um, that as a part of a condition. Um, and yeah, and it and it's and it can be really. Um, uh, and I, I'm approaching it now with like some curiosity, you know, uh, and 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 a, and also a, um, letting it letting it be uh as a and and just trying to work i mean it's like it happened it's going to happen throughout this talk a little bit um but you know just just letting it um be what it is and this is okay and um so this is like so just to sort of like wrap summarize what i was saying as a speech language pathologist some of the um things that i did in different um like therapy capacities was and was thinking about the use of idioms um, and how they're used in these like social um, settings or, um, I mean, they're used all the time. Like if you start sort of like uh, paying attention, which I started to pay like close attention to, to these 13, um, like you hear them constantly, like daily basically, but they're so, uh, and, and so for for me, you know, I get, I get sort of a little bit of, um, I think sometimes literally about like what is what someone is saying when they say like, you know, um, oh, I'm in a pickle, you know, and then I, and then I think like literally about what that means, and then <laughs> and that sort of is humorous to me, and then um, anyway, and so there's like. So, and then there are these like layers of like socially, what, what is that saying? What does, is the quote meaning, um, the layering of that um, idiom in that particular situation or whatever. And a lot of the, and there's sort of this way in which when, you know, you're living with, um, with illness and especially when it, when there are these like sort of more serious moments of like, you know, like when you're dealing with something that's like 
really sort of all consuming, you know, people sort of like offer these um, sayings because they kind of maybe don't always know what to say. And it's, and I actually find for me personally, not only it, is it this um, moment where I can, uh, where it is kind of comforting to me. And then also there's like this layer of like humor <laughs> because, and then also this layer of like, you know, also these sayings, a lot of them are from like the 1800s, you know, from, and, and come out of like working class culture in the US. Um, so there are like all of these things that I was thinking about in this work. Um, and then just uh, creating this, um, these idioms in like this, these object forms that sort of just bring it all around. I think maybe I answered some of your question. <laughs> you did. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> Jackie, would you like to talk a little bit about, um, I can repeat it, just the end, about um, how language and narrative can hinder our comprehension of multifaceted and nuanced stories, and what got you interested in that? Um, well, you know, I, I, I think the, um, so the experience that I had growing up, um, that might be a good place to start. Um, I um, grew up in a household where we spoke multiple languages, and um, and there, you know, when you grow up in that kind of household, there's sometimes you don't, you know, you you don't get the full story, or you don't hear everything, or you don't understand what's going on, and so there are those moments of um, fragmentation of the the narrative or um, yeah, just, you know, an everyday situation, you, you know, I, I often just kind of went with, the, I was the youngest, so I just kind of went with what was going on um, and hoped everything would work out. <laughs> um, but I, I think that idea of, um, of just not understanding or um, being confused or um, that is something that I uh, really push in the work, you know, just with all of the symbols and, you know, symbols as language and, um, you know, an oversaturation of information and language. Uh, so there, you know, there are phrases that I pulled from, um, you know, rap lyrics or um, some ranchero music or, you know, music that, uh, um, that I listened to in the studio. Um, so there might be some of these little glimpses, and then there's also, you know, um, sayings that my mother might say, um, or um, there's Arabic in the mix there too. And so putting that all together, kind of creating these, um, this like oversaturation of information and collage to kind of mimic that experience that I had growing up of like, what the hell is going on? Or I got that, but then, you know, you could hear in my house three languages at once. Um, and um, so that that kind of um, experience is one that I, I'm trying to, you know, really make happen in the work. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess also there's um, a playfulness and sort of a cheekiness with it that I find with your work too, Libby. Um, that's like um, almost an invitation to figure these things out, and then you know, um, I have all of the I have all of the information, and you don't. <laughs> There's something about that that's you know the sort of like cheekiness of of um, of play, um, and um, you know the the not everything needs to be understood, and I think that that's something that as viewers of art, we've come to this place of like, um, I'm consuming art, you know, and I want to know what it means. And I, you know, this like, I, I'm going to, you know, understand it. And by understanding it, I consume it. And I, that's something that I'm kind of pushing against a little bit. Um, but I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. I, I have so many follow-up questions for both of you, but we'd never get out of here if I said them all. So um, I'm just going to actually skip to one more question, and then I'll let both of you ask some questions of each other. Um, so early on in this exhibition's planning stages, we talked about a parallel of play in both of your practices, as you alluded to. Uh, this show takes an expansive definition of play, arguing that the act does not always elicit joyful and can even preempt mixed feelings or bittersweetness. Um, and I was wondering how you feel play acts in your process as an artist, thinking about either joyful moments or the more expanded definition. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, play is um, definitely a part of the process of the like conceptual process and then also the material process, you know, like gathering these materials, like, and then also the, um, yeah, the most most of the time the construction's playful, although some of the time I'm like, <laughs> why have I done this to myself? <laughs> this is so much, this is so hard. Like how, I don't know how to make a picture out of fabric. That's, you know, like, like, I don't know how to make enchiladas, like, what, <laughs> out of fabric, like, what am I, and so, like, sometimes, like, the play turns into business, and then it comes <laughs> back in, and then when I, like, get through that moment of, uh, like, seriousness, is like, play again, and, um, yeah, and so I definitely, like, play is, like, throughout the making, yeah, because for me, like, that's why I'm an artist, you know, because like, I, I do just want to play. Like, I do just want to, like, be in a world where as an adult, I can create a different world, a different reality, you know, whether that's in drag, um, you know, or like through installation, or, you know, and like with the drawings too, you know, these are you can see the play in the, in this mark making and like how casual it is and you know uh, and and sort of like crude in some ways you know and um yeah play like play is sort of like at the forefront uh, like the the root of my practice as an artist which is you know like uh, it, you know and also my work is very important don't forget that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but you know, like I, you know, like play is, it's really important for me as an adult. I don't think we play enough, you know, and that like becomes really apparent to me when I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I have the, I have this opportunity to like, to have this, to expand and like create this world. Like I have this space and this time and like, and I realize how much of the other time is like not play. We need way more play mm -hmm. um, as adults. So yeah, so it's like very rooted in my artistic practice. Yeah, yeah I think that um, this is maybe the question that you skipped, but that that physical action of, of making feels very playful to me. There's a lot of um, risk taking in uh, the work. Um, because I'm cutting up older, or I'm cut not older, but just I'm, I'm constantly cutting up my work and repurposing it. And um, so there's a lot of, um, here we go, you know, and um, cutting it up and uh, see what happens. And then the experimentation, um, like to me that that, like when we, when we were children, like there's a lot of risk taking and play, you know, and the sort of, um, like letting go of um, letting go of uh, all of the um, the rules in a way um, to get to the next point or to get to the next step. Um, it's just super important. I think I agree. You know, like the play in our lives and in our studios, and I think is super uh, yeah critical. Um, my art's important too, but I play. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? 
Um, I was also just wondering if either of you had any questions for one another um, after seeing one another's work, uh, spending so much time like putting the show together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Would you like yeah. To first lady? Yeah. Sure. I know. I. I mean. Well, I just want to like nerd out for a second in terms of like you know <laughs> like, like so process is super important. You can like so I I gather from the, these works that like my. My imagination is like you're like tearing, you know, the yeah. excavation process is almost like physical, totally. um, especially in like when it like cutting out the act of like cutting out mm -hmm. these larger shapes, but then like the smaller, it just seems mm -hmm. like I'm getting, you know, um, like enjoyment as a mm -hmm. viewer mm -hmm. by thinking about your way of uh pursuing the materiality, you know, and like, mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, I, yeah, is that, does that happen? No, yeah. that's totally <laughs> happening. Yeah. Cool. I mean, there's a lot of, um, moments where, um, I'm glad I'm alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> because I'm doing really, uh, ridiculous movements with my body or just try it because I'm in the studio alone and, you know, like I have a foot holding this thing and I'm like holding that. And it's like a, what is that? And it's a saying, it's an idiom. Oh, um, see, uh, they're all, um, they're everywhere. Yeah, the um, comedy of errors, Okay. right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like very, um, yeah, it's wild. So when I was working on this piece that was 11 feet by 11 feet, it was, it was uh, crazy because... I am a small person, and so I, but I, I knew that I had to like bring it down to the ground on occasion. The works were hung, and so I would <laughs> take the works and like rip them off the wall. They would fall on top of me. <laughs> I, but you know, like I'm like, ah, <laughs> you know, and then I had to like, you know, there's a lot of that, That's like, right, a lot of crazy. Mm -hmm. A lot of sweating. A lot of sweating, like I could die right now. <laughs> <laughs> but then if you die in your studio, that's like pretty it's cool. really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> studio practice truly is like intellectual and physical exertion simultaneously. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I, what, question that I have, um, with the drawings, are you, are these happening before and maybe you already said this, but yeah. are, do these happen before you're making these works or do you sometimes go back and forth of like doing a drawing and making the thing, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. Um, so, <laughs> so it happened that, um, I just imagine I that you have like, you have, because they're quick and yeah, yeah. you ha could have like hundreds of these. Drawings. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I did. No, yeah, like, so when I started, I, when I started the picnic, I was like, there are so many food idioms. This is cool. I'm going to, and, you know, and I did, like, some research about, um, about them. Um, yeah, because I, because then I got curious and was finding that like, some of them are from, like, the 1400s. Like, what? Mm. This, is, this is, and then, and then I started thinking about, like, how many times people have, there was like also this moment of like great comfort when I thought about all the times people like said these things like in an act of kindness or, mm -hmm. or snarkiness or, you know, like I was like, gosh, humans are like kind of beautiful and cute, you know? And, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so like, so, th so that's a part of the process too, like sort of research and getting like, and sort of nerding out and getting excited about um, getting into the minutia, like a little bit of a, a wormhole. And then and then I was like, yeah. And when when I sort of commit, that's when like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw it out like a little bit of a map. Mm. And I and I wasn't even necessarily going to. And I had them tacked up in my studio. And then when I would make one, I would put it I would put it to the side like you're done, you know. Uh, when I made the object, mm. yeah, and uh, my spouse, who's super smart, um, was like, "These drawings <laughs> should be in the show," and I was like, 
no, I don't know, you know? And then, then I was like, no, I do. And then, but a part of me also wanted the audience to, the viewer to like have almost like a key or like a way in mm-hmm. to, because my work like it is like this act of like softness. So I was like that, yeah, I, I want people to like have an, um, if they want, you know, to like have an understanding of like where artists, what artists think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, super smart spouse said, like, let's, you know, you should frame these and put, them. so, so yeah, uh, so they, but they still like were tacked up and then, okay, you're done. And I did have more, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, maybe that'll be for the next picnic or whatever. No picnic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, no, but okay. So look, I mean, well, let's just go for it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, love your use of color Mm -hmm. obviously I'm a colorful gal (laughs) no and like I so I just want to know more about Mm -hmm. like the choice I about the choices here um but I don't know that's like a really big question but you know I love that you use fluorescence Mm -hmm. I love that you use glittery I love you know like I love that they're yeah, like small, like super small, bright marks that are like really. You use a lot of saturated color, mm-hmm. you know. That seems really important to mm-hmm. the work. So I don't know if you. I would love to know more about how you think, mm-hmm. what you think about when you're like choosing a color or. Yeah, I. Um, I mean, honestly, it's it's a very intuitive thing, and I just kind of. Look, you know, um, the colors that I'm attracted to. I also there there is something. Like maybe it's that that part of me that um, is cheeky um, yeah. that I want to create kind of discomfort in um, the color choices. That there, it's like a, again an um, an oversaturation of information. I think color adds to that, you know, um, and, you know, guiding, guiding people on, you know, this, this feeling of, um, intensity. Um, but, uh, something that, that happened recently, maybe I was talking to you about this. I was looking at my, my grand pictures of my grandmother's home in Honduras and, um, and I, I visited a few times in my life, um, and and <laughs> I couldn't. Believe, I just I didn't have this like in the top of my memory. But um, the she was like color crazy or something. Like every single room in her house was a different color, I'm and they like were like, artist. I know <laughs> she was an artist. <laughs> um, but she had like these um, hot pinks, you know, that the, the pink on the the scallop's edge, but this sort of light pink. This color was uh, in the house. Um, it was aquamarine colors, and so that was like a, a kind of a moment of like, oh, well, maybe that's like another. That's another thing that I'm like kind of digging into, which is sort of this history that. Um, that I have that I was that I'd forgotten about like memory and intuition are sort of yeah coming through in your work right cool I have another question but should we open it up for questions okay. or yeah. ask one more question and then we can okay. open it up sure I so the drag performance <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um I um you know, I, there's something about, this might be a stretch, but there's something about, you know, making these three-dimensional edible objects and their slouchiness and their imperfection that's really drag to me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm curious, mm-hmm. like, how, like, what that, like, in your, in your other work and, like, how does that? Yeah. Could... No. 
like a queer. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Like there's like a. Well, so when I think about what you know me um, performing as a very masculine man, <laughs> there's <laughs> this um, this way in which um, it uh, I don't right I don't quite fit into the proposed masculine uh, binary structure that so in and and I really like to play with this um, with the severity that you know we find ourselves in as trying to um, exist in this uh, space and time where um, where you know some of us are really trying to push beyond the constructs of this um, heteropatriarchy. Um, yeah, and so there's this way in which um, when I'm performing as Nacho and I'm joking as much as I am about masculinity and how it's not there, it, there there's the function of masculinity. And like the, it, it's for for me in the show or in the performance or or you know sort of beyond it doesn't like function properly and like I think and I think about that with soft sculpture, especially soft sculpture food like it's not functioning quote unquote mm -hmm. like the way that that. Um, you know, it needs to to mm -hmm. be a real picnic or whatever. You know, I'm definitely like pushing on and playing with what what is functional, quote unquote, or what is real or known. Mm -hmm. You know, and like playing with reality. And I think that's what excites me about. Um, proposing that like Nacho's level of masculinity is so um, is, is also like proposing that that's also like he's functioning quote unquote as like a very masculine you know like you know person or whatever mm -hmm. and just like playing with the idea that like that like gender doesn't it, it doesn't function for a lot of us who don't fall into like mm -hmm. these category, the binary categories, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. So uh, there's there's definitely like a connection. I'm playing playing with all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. I feel like your pieces also are like food and drag, almost. Yeah. You know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'd like to open it up. I think we can take one or two questions. Um, does anyone have some a burning question they want to share, ask? I mean, I have more, but. <laughs> <laughs> Are we sure? It's OK, we've covered a lot, we've covered a lot. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did this might sound kind of silly? Did how did you like put all of that together? Like sewing, like hot gluing, like all of it? Like how did you like put that all to how did you make it like one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um there's no hot glue, there's no adhesive. Um it's all sewn. Wow. Yeah, so that's high drag. <laughs> yeah, 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 like, right, yeah. right. If, we, if I think, right, if I think that through to like the process of um, mm -hmm. building that, that's that's so true. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's all sewn either by my hand or by um, you know machine. Um, yeah, and there are, I mean, I, I won't tell you like all the secrets, but um, there are like some uh, some metal armature 
um, in some of the pieces so that they're sort of like defying gravity. Um, but but yeah, they're all it's all hand sewn by me. Very cool. <laughs> Thanks. Anybody else? Um, I have a question. It's sort of consistent behind me. Um, for, cause I know you talked a bit about how for your pieces, it was a lot of like um, fast, quick, motion pieces. But there's also, if you really look at a lot of your pieces, you can see there's a lot of delicate work with like the small little cutouts or small little drawings and like mm -hmm. like pieces that are being interwoven. So are there like parts of your process where you're like just super hyper focused in it mm -hmm. and you're like, you're doing like the really delicate, agonizing parts of it? as well yeah um yes thanks for noticing yeah there's there is a bit of um Julie, what, so lauren <laughs> and i went to parsons uh together and studied jewelry um and i um so there is that this part of my brain that wants to be really intimate and really up close with my work. And so, yeah, there are a lot of, um, you know, there's hand sewing, um, there is the drawing that's really um, time intensive, um, but that is also mixed in with a lot of adhesive, actually. <laughs> a lot of um, uh, gel medium, you know, like slathering the gel medium on as I'm collaging. Um, so they're, they're big, they're big expression, but yeah, there's also a lot of small moments as well. Um, I am trying to be, uh, considerate of everyone's time, but before we close, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to? Cause I know I skipped some questions. Hmm. Um, no, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think there's. I do, you said the word maximal, mm -hmm. and I think that's also like a really close parallel to mm -hmm. artworks, like the maximal qualities of the, in Color different ways. Labor, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Textures. Yeah. yeah. Scale. Scale. Mm -hmm. Layering. Yeah. I think, so I think that's really exciting and like, there's this, there's this artist called um, Machine Dazzle, and um, mm -hmm. they had an exhibition at um, Museum of Art and Design, and uh, they had this, uh, and it was called Queer Maximalism. And so mm -hmm. that, I, I've been thinking a lot about the idea of queer maximalism and like um, how that sort of like functions in, in my work. Um, and how uh, I think, and also how um, play is a big part of maximal qualities too, and and also, um, and also in drag, and you know, anyway. Yeah, so they're yeah. like play and maximalism sort of like go hand in hand for me, and I mm -hmm. think maybe mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that queer maximal. That's yeah. Machine <laughs> Cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, I, I guess one thing that I, um, I, I wanted to mention is that the, that's important to the work um, that we didn't talk about is the sort of research that goes into. I mean, you mentioned researching the language and the idioms, and I, and I think you know that's another connection. I spend a lot of time. Um, researching objects of antiquity from Egypt. And um, as mentioned, I spent some time in London looking at the collection of the British Museum and having as intimate relationships with, <laughs> um, with these objects um, that, that exist in this, in this massive collection at the museum, um, drawing the, the objects and then, um, and then bringing them into the context of my work um, as a way of sort of repatriating them um, in, into this, this, new, this narrative that I have created. Um, and so if you see some of these, like this 
uh, Zvaz. Um, there's, they're kind of, there's one character that's like this. These are actual, I have the, the, the whole like list of provenance and like where you can find them um, in a database that I um, have created for myself. So they're, um, yeah. And I spend a lot of time with archeologists, um, which nerd. I'm a nerd. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to also uh, thank everyone who helped make this show come together, the students who helped, the art department who assisted. Um, and I also wanted to thank both of you so much. I, thank you're, you. You're, you. you're my first artist that I've brought in from out of town. The show is really special yeah. and important to me. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I've always been drawn to maximalist and playful work, and I feel like this is exactly what I want to see in the gallery going forward, like work that, you know, exudes joy, but is, you know, very research intensive. Like you can go deep or you can, but you can go deep like with a smile while looking at it. So <laughs> I really appreciate everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.